Weapons and War. This is a uh, US built M48 patent tank deployed by the Pakistan Army. The conventional wisdom is certainly that weapons do cause war. Both the League of Nations and the United Nations have assumed that weapons make war more likely, and so by disarming, you can make peace. The logic follows something like this. If you eliminate the tools of war, then you remove the temptation and the capacity to make war, and this makes, war, this makes peace more likely. Much of the inspiration for this comes from studies of the link between handgun availability and crime within society. Now, this has had more influence on the link between firearms and their sales and intrastate wars, typical of, say, uh, Africa in the late Cold War and early post-Cold War period. Here you have thousands, tens of thousands, millions of assault rifles and landmines that are that enable non-state actors to then revolt against the state. It's generally widely accepted, even if it is not well explained. Classical or typical cases of weapons causing interstate war is the uh, European railway system as a cause of the First World War. It enabled the rapid mobilization of millions of soldiers on each other's borders and then left the state stuck with a use it or lose it dilemma since those uh, men in uniform were no longer working in the factories or collecting the harvest. The problem is that the railways could also be thought of as being able to provide defense. By putting soldiers on a border very rapidly, it deters an enemy from attacking you. What I want to try to explain is this link between weapons and war. Before we start, though, I want to make you aware of some simple facts. First, weapons are inanimate, and without people, they're idle. They don't do anything. Two, you don't need weapons to have a war. In Rwanda in 1993, 800,000 people were massacred, largely with household implements such as uh, sharpened brooms and farming equipment. Three, some weapons can cause peace. Nuclear weapons are too terrifying to be used and may explain in part the peaceful resolution of the Cold War. Four, some societies with easy availability of small arms, such as the Swiss Reserve military system, are relatively peaceful and do not suffer from the same level of domestic level crime as, say, other states. Uh, during the Cold War, although uh, it's no longer the situation, 650,000 Swiss citizens kept assault rifles at home. There is a tradition, ancient in fact, that it is weakness that causes war, not strength and the availability of arms. This is captured by the Roman general Vegetius in his quote, Civis Pacem Parabellum. This is the basis for deterrence theory and we can recall how deterrence failure was a cause of the Egyptian attack on Israel in 1973. See this pachem, parabellum, means if you want peace, prepare for war. Weapons can therefore cause peace as well. Number six, weapons accidents do not matter. There's this uh, 1950s film of two medieval armies facing off against each other in a standoff, neither is attacking. But underneath one of the horses is a snake, and so one of the knights draws their sword to strike the snake, and his own army interprets that as a call to attack. And then his army attacks, and the army other attacks, and then you, you have uh, a general uh, battle. This type of accidental war is extended to how nuclear weapons could be used accidentally and then lead to a large-scale nuclear conflict. It should be obvious that the link between weapons and war will not be direct and simple, but rather complex. Weapons as causes of policy can be conceptualized in any or all of three ways. First, weapons can be seen as a provocative cause of war. These are instances in which war is driven by the stimulative or provocative effects of weapons uh, particularly uh, the effects they have on the opposing side. 
For example, state A would purchase weapons and this would make state B insecure and then state B would then attack state A. This is also captured by the notion of the security dilemma in which preparations for defense by either side, A or B, accumulates until eventually one or the other attacks. The problem with ascribing weapons as a cause of war in this instance is that there has never been a conflict driven entirely by insecurity provoked by the provocative acquisition of arms. Instead, underlying all arms races are an original political disagreement. For example, Israel attacked Egypt in 1956 because Egypt had purchased weapons from the Soviet Union. Thus, the Egyptian arms deal had a provocative effect on the 1956 war by provoking an Israeli attack. However, the Egyptians had obtained the arms in the first instance because of a preceding political dispute over the existence of Israel. In other words, the Egyptian purchase of arms explains the timing of the conflict, but not the underlying insecurity produced by the Egyptian political commitment that uh, they should probably support the Palestinian Fedayeen in their raids against Israeli targets. Weapons could also be conceived of as facilitative causes of war. These are instances in which a state has a pre-existing policy, which might remain dormant in the absence of available means. Once the means are available, war occurs because they can facilitate the desired policy of the government. For example, many of Israel's frontline enemies have in the past sought to destroy Israel, but have been unable to due to a lack of resources. When these resources became available, as they did in 1973, then Israel became the subject of an attack. Another example is North Korea. It had the policy of conquering South Korea, but it, it has since, since its uh, first attempted um, attack and failure, it hasn't resumed because it, South, South Korea is not that weak. China has the policy and goal of conquering Taiwan. Guatemala has the policy of conquering Belize. But each of these lack at the moment the ability to carry out their goal. Weapons can also be conceived of as generative causes of war. These are instances in which a sudden availability of a weapon in a country's arsenal stimulates or generates a new policy for that state based on the characteristics of the weapon it obtained. This is a cause of war if the weapon is interpreted as optimal for aggressive use and it influences the state to pursue an offensive goal, such as attack or conquest. These are not facilitative causes because the new policy the state has was not dormant and did not precede the availability of the weapon system. Generative policy influence can also happen when the weapons purchased for an earlier purpose must be reinterpreted because the previous goal has been attained or forgotten or rejected. The British had originally obtained a large portion of their navy at the end of the 19th century to manage continuous naval scares with France. But when France became friendly to England, the British possessed a large force and they refocused it on Russia and then against an emergent Germany. British arms, however, did not in this instance provoke a war. Weapons as a generative cause of war explains in part how states that increased their military strength also frequently changed their goals. As the British became more powerful, they repeatedly increased their interests. So this helps explain an aspect of realism, which is if interests are defined in terms of power, then as you get more power, you then ask yourself, well, how can I use this power? And then you achieve uh, a new agenda for goals. Now, there are examples of this. The very, very short examples is the Shah's Navy. In the early 1970s, the Shah purchased hovercraft to land marines. And then shortly thereafter, Iran seized Abu Musa, an island in the Persian Gulf, and the greater and lesser Tums, two other islands. The Israeli Air Force had um, established a capability that allowed it to have some superiority over its enemies, but the nature of the capability also made it vulnerable to being subject to a first strike. If the Egyptians attacked first, the Israeli Air Force would be more vulnerable. So those who operated the instrument put a lot of emphasis on attacking first. And the third case, Pakistani patents, will be the subject at the end of this lecture. So let us explore six different possible explanations for the link between weapons and war. First, armament spending, military spending. 
States with high levels of military expenditure or military personnel per capita of population are more likely to be involved in an interstate war. Militarized dyads are six times as likely to go to war. However, this finding is undermined by the endogeneity problem that mutually hostile states will engage in weapons purchases because they are hostile or because they anticipate war. So alternative interpretation of the link here is that, again, it might simply be that a state is anticipating war defensively and that this evidence is a symptom rather than a cause of the war. A state may have a constantly high level of military burden, which is also then not an arms race. Arms merchants. Now, I should put a note on arms merchants. There have been very long and universal accusations and very little evidence and scholarship that arms merchants cause war, but it's journalistically a very popular notion. The sociologist H. A. Hobson wrote a book at the end of the 19th century accusing arms merchants of seeking war. And there were similar accusations of profiteering during and after the First World War. However, 30 years later, H.A. Hobson disavowed his famous book as a product of a youthful mind. In other words, it wasn't a real phenomenon. There's a popular myth that arms merchants played a crucial role in bringing the United States into the First World War in 1917. And this was widespread enough that the pacifist movement compelled the U.S. Senate in 1934 to set up an inquiry committee headed by Senator Nye. Many isolationist, isolationist Americans were afraid that munitions manufacturers would trick the U.S. to enter the worsening problems in Europe in the mid-1930s. The DuPont family, to avoid endless suspicion for responsibility of U.S. involvement in the upcoming war, declared that their family corporations would no longer be involved in munitions manufacturing. When the war broke out, the U.S. government approached the DuPont family and essentially compelled them to return to the manufacturing of arms. Now the picture you have here at the bottom is of an F-111 and it's an interesting case. And the Rand Corporation did a bit of a study on this weapon system. The Pentagon contracted a corporation to build this weapon. When the Pentagon makes a contract, it specifies future capabilities, ones that are currently not feasible. And then arms manufacturers submit bids, and they then try to solve these problems. It's a gamble. They may not be able to solve it. The Pentagon wanted a long-range, low-altitude, uh, multiple geometry wing aircraft, so it could be supersonic or fly very low in order to have high precision bombing. So the wing on this aircraft actually swings from a closed to an open position. Ultimately, the aircraft ran into enormous cost overruns for the corporation. And in the contract, the Pentagon didn't have to pay the cost overruns, but the corporation would have paid enormous penalties if it left the contract. So the corporation was trapped to complete the F-111, which ultimately it did at a loss. So this aircraft, which was very efficient and used for uh, a few decades by the US military, um, performed uh, um, at expectations. It was an excellent airplane, but it did not make a profit for the corporation that manufactured it. So it's not true that arms merchants automatically always gluttonously take an advantage of the uh, easy money that comes from defense ministries looking for weapons. This is a focus more on interstate weapons. There's a lot of interest in the proliferation of small arms as a problem in the developing world, particularly how it inhibits uh, development by causing civil war, which then leads to famines. And so uh, there's an assumed link that if you cut off the supply of the small arms, uh, it'll then uh, create the political space in order to have uh, economic development. And that somehow the arms merchants are associated with this. That arms merchants, rifle manufacturers, are responsible for somehow making crime possible by making these weapons available to uh, criminals and other individuals. It may be true.
uh, but the logic doesn't necessarily extend to the logic of starting a war between two states. The third possible explanation of the link between weapons and war is the conflict spiral or arms race. A conflict spiral driven arms race is an action reaction process in which two states are competitively engaged in the buildup of arms. And this results in an increase in insecurity generating misperceptions. In conflict spirals, adversaries tend to act on the perception of rapidly closing windows of opportunity. A window of opportunity that's closing gives you the choice of attacking now or later. And it thereby escalates the dispute and increases the likelihood of a preemptive war. Now a war is preemptive if it, if it breaks out primarily because the attacker feels it will itself be the target of a military attack in the very near future, in a couple of hours or days. The goal of attacking first is that you disrupt their plans for attack. So during war these are called spoiling attacks because armies that are about to attack are more vulnerable as they're not dug in. They're basically deployed openly to enable easy maneuver. A preventative war is different, different from a preemptive war. A preventative war is one in which the attacker attacks a defender because it believes that the defender is becoming stronger over time in the medium to the long term, typically measured in the number of years. The goal here is simply to assume that the attacker attacks before becoming too weak. So a preventative war is speculative. They're, you know, the, the other side may get stronger and then turn on us. A, pre a preemptive war is one in which you are certain that the enemy is going to attack. States can attack for both motives. You fight a preventative war against an enemy that is getting stronger and you attack them now uh, because they are about to attack you knowing that you're about to attack them. Windows result from the fact that most arms driven action reaction processes are actually erratic and uneven responses to an adversary. Eventually, it gets to a point where the crisis triggers mutual preemption attempts in which two states attack each other in expectation that the other would attack. Now the solution, typically to a conflict spiral, is arms control. The principal arms control method of managing conflict spirals is to slow it down by specifying limits on the number of weapons procured. For example, there was the 1922 Naval Washington Treaty in which the English and the uh, Americans, to avoid an arms race, got together with the French and the Italians and the Japanese and specified a division of the total naval power and put limits on the construction of the size of certain ships and guns. There was the Rush-Bagot Agreement of 1817 which limited the number of British and American naval forces on the Great Lakes and the Lake Champlain and that treaty only ran out in the 1990s. There's the START II agreement on nuclear weapons signed between Russia and the US in 1993. Now there's an important point. Most political scientists believe that the focus on weapons and war is flawed since there has never been an arms race between two states in which the spiral began with the acquisition of weapons first and the generation of mutual hostility later. All weapons purchases follow from pre-existing political disputes. States go to war because of some underlying political disagreement. The relevance of weapons is that they may make the tensions worse than they would otherwise be. They may increase suspicion and insecurity, and they may even provoke disputes and provide triggers for war. The great challenge in understanding an arms race is disentangling across each progressive step of escalation what portion can be explained by the conflict spiral itself and what additional explanation was caused by the weapons themselves. Since weapons are never the sole cause, we always have this decomposition problem. Now, Lewis Richardson was a mathematician who came up with a model of arms races. So for Lewis Richardson, an arms race is an action-reaction process in which two states are competitively engaged in the buildup of arms which results in an increase in insecurity generating misperceptions that cause decision makers to choose to go to war. Lewis Fry Richardson was a mathematician who served as an ambulance driver in the First World War and he wanted to capture the logic of how the preceding armaments race led to the First World War. He approached the problem mathematically and derived a simultaneous differential equation to simulate the effects of an arms race. The terms in his model 
that you need to focus on include military spending levels, domestic tolerance for military spending, and overall tension levels between the two competitors. Richardson hypothesized that two states enter into a competition against each other which causes a steady increase in their total military spending as they try to match each other. Eventually, the military spending accelerates to such an extent that it moves away from a stable or constant value. As it moves away from this point of equilibrium, the likelihood of war increases. So here you can see his formula, his main equation. You have X and Y are the two countries. G and H is the level of hostility. Uh, a and B is the domestic burden, and K and L are constants. Here's the uh, application of it uh, to the lead up to the First World War. And here you see a linear relationship. This is uh, Richardson's original data on the arms race proceeding uh, immediately before the First World War. You see France and Russia against Germany and Austria-Hungary. This is uh, an illustration of the changes in expenditure on the Army and Navy. And you can see uh, for the different color codes between 1880 and 1914, the huge rise in investment by Germany and Austria-Hungary. Uh, even by countries like, um, well, Italy didn't rise that much. Italy doubled over that period. Great Britain also doubled, and most of England's doubling was after 1900, mainly to deal with the challenge from Germany. France less than doubled over that period. Uh, Russia also doubled. So virtually every country was seriously affected by having to invest in arms uh, in the 30 years leading up to the First World War. Here you can see other uh, bits of data for a U.S.-USSR arms race, Israel and Egypt, and these are all applying uh, Richardson's technique. Here you can see uh, the American-Russian um, expenditure and how it relates to uh, the um, exceeding of the constant by the arms race. And here you can see the same logic applied to Israel and Egypt. Now Richardson applied it to the period of 1909 to 1913 to see if the period just prior to the First World War was caused by it. There was a flurry of research done on the basis of his mathematics in the 1960s due to the emergence of computing power and of course the uh, nuclear arms race. But while there are empirically derivable thresholds, it has been driven by almost a complete absence of theory. There are a number of conceptual problems with the Richardsonian equations. One, the problem with the theory is that, in fact, it's very difficult to tell what is a normal point of equilibrium. At the beginning of the 20th century, Great Britain spent a far smaller portion of its national wealth, but a much larger portion of its national budget on defense than it does today. States in those days had much smaller budgets. They had much weaker bureaucracies. They had less efficient methodologies for tracking wealth and finance. And so arms races had less of an impact on their national economies. We saw earlier how a country like Germany and Austria-Hungary tripled or quadrupled their spending on their armies and navies. But uh, much of that was just the natural growth of the German, arm, of the German economy. The, uh, the economy quadrupled in that period. So why wouldn't military spending? Objection number two. Richardson does not have an explanation for how increased instability in spending leads to war. Does it create windows of opportunity? Are there points of no return? Does it, does it ratchet up tensions? Objection number three. Even if military spending increased prior to a war, it may not be the cause. It may simply be the anticipation of the war. Here you can see um, uh, Togo, the Japanese victor at the Battle of Tsushima against the Russians that ended the 1905 war. And the Japanese invested a lot of money in uh, initially a very small navy. Uh, but by the late 1930s, they had the largest carrier force in the world. So what's the statistical evidence? Well, there was an intensive statistical analysis begun in the late 70s by Michael Wallace, Paul Deal, and Susan Sample. A moderate relationship was found by Michael Wallace, but by the end of the 1980s, Paul Deal had succeeded in falsifying that relationship. 
Susan Sample responded in the mid-1990s with evidence of a statistically significant moderate relationship, and the debate has since settled down over providing a theory for the relationship. So that was uh, more or less in the early 2000s. Uh, Susan Sample's 2002 uh, article indicates that the presence of nuclear weapons reduces the likelihood of conflict in major states more than minor states because whereas minor states can fall back on alliances, major states have less opportunity to do so. Well, so the general finding was that isolated arms buildups increase uh, do not themselves increase the likelihood of war. It depends on the interactivity with the opponent. Sinise and Vasquez found that arms races increase the likelihood of war for states involved in disputes by six times. So uh, weapons make uh, uh, crossing that threshold to war more likely. So this is Wallace's cross tabulation um, that started the whole debate on the relationship between arms races and escalation. It made use of the Correlates of War project. You can see the intersection of arms races and no arms races and war and no war. Uh, what is of interest is the depreciation function that you can see at the bottom uh, where it uh, evaluates the uh, value of K. Because of course a weapon that you buy now is going to get weaker and smaller over time in the future and then you have that relationship between the uh, two countries. And so he's only counting weapons 10 years um, in the arms uh, purchase process. Now there was an influential project done by Ted Hopf in 1991 in his analysis of Europe um, and war in the periods 1495 to 1521, which was a multipolar period, versus 1521 to 1559, which is more a bipolar period when, when Habsburg Spain basically confronted everyone in Europe. And he found the polarity was not the explanation for the incidence of war and peace. Uh, rather, he provided an alternative explanation that it was the offense-defense balance of the weapons that were purchased within the context of an arms race that actually explains when war happened and when it didn't. This is a very interesting argument. Measuring arms races is quite complex. I mean, weapons bought in one year last several more years. So how do you calculate depreciation? Some U.S. bombers are over 50 years old. It has been difficult to measure also the interaction quantitatively between two parties. Uh, there was a dissertation done about the nuclear arms race between the US and USSR, and it seemed that they were racing in isolation. The Americans were simply building as many weapons as they could, and were basically focusing on how many ground targets there were, and the Soviets were just manufacturing plutonium with absolutely no limit. The, the two nuclear arsenals could not therefore be mathematically or statistically linked. They were independently being built with only a rough idea of how they're interacting with their opponent. In, in some sense, the German-British arms race was similar. The Germans certainly built a navy to confront the English navy, but the German army was financed with a view to different opponents, not the English, but the French and the Russians. And we think today about the U.S.-Chinese Navy and the buildup that's occurring in the South China Sea and on the uh, Pacific Rim, and whether that's going to increase disputes or crises or incidents that could escalate to war. Another link between weapons and war is imbalance in armaments. The most common cause of war cited in diplomatic circles is the military imbalance. The logic is that when two antagonist states are not evenly matched, or when arms sales undermine the pre-existing balance between adversaries, war can result. War results because the stronger sees it can obtain more and coerce the weaker, or the weaker attacks fearing that the stronger will eventually attack. After Israel's War of Independence in 1948, the US, Great Britain, and France established the Tripartite Agreement which was essentially an arms embargo of Israel, Egypt, Syria, and Jordan. The goal was to keep these states from acquiring arms and then attacking each other. The tripartite agreement worked. It worked until, in 1955, Egypt obtained a deal to purchase some 200 tanks and other weapons from Czechoslovakia and the Soviet Union. The equilibrium thereafter failed. The tripartite agreement collapsed. France sold about 200 tanks to Israel, and in 1956, while Egypt was still learning to use its new weapons from Czechoslovakia, Israel attacked and defeated Egypt. 
Thereafter, Israel and the Arab states received at first hundreds, then thousands of tanks and aircraft over the next 30 years, which was to include at least two more regional wars in 1967 and 1973. The British and the U.S. also attempted to manage the sale of arms to India and Pakistan to ensure that the balance held there. I raised the issue with Roger Hilsman, one of Kennedy's undersecretaries, if the U.S. coordinated its 400 M48 patent sales to Pakistan with England's sale of 200 centurions to India. Um, but he said no. He said that it's not true. But I am very suspicious. Uh, I think it's very unlikely that there wasn't some coordination at some level. After 1965, there was um, a collapse with India purchasing weapons from the Soviet Union. Uh, it basically, India diversified its source of weapons, and then Pakistan responded by purchasing weapons from China. Now, not all U.S. or British arms sales result in war. Weapon sales to about 100 states by the U.S. are done during the Cold War to keep them from turning to communism and since then to enhance their defense. The US, for example, is committed to the defense of uh, South Korea and Taiwan and frequently either sells weapons directly or uh, licenses certain systems for indigenous weapons. However, this is not really about weapons per se at all, but about the balance of armaments, the fluctuations that they create, and the windows of opportunity during which one state has a temporary advantage over the other. So these imbalances can sometimes provoke an arms race. The fifth link between weapons and war is loss of control. There's always the danger of the loss of control, whether it's accidental or unintended or unauthorized weapons acquisitions or the use by subordinates or third parties. In the first instance, units cut off from outside communication may become uh, afraid and may launch an attack in fear that the order was given but never received. Submarines and road mobile nuclear weapons uh, may have this type of dilemma. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, it was found in um, 1998 when there was sort of a, uh, a round table discussion in Havana by many of the participants, including Robert McNamara, it was found that um, the Russian had given permission, if attacked, for the Soviet submarines to fire nuclear torpedoes on the US Navy. Now, in the second instance, the unauthorized use of strategic weapons obtained by a hostile third party may trigger an unwanted war. The US was constantly uh, uh, concerned that the Chinese would be um, uh, somehow convinced to start a nuclear war with the US by the Soviet Union. We don't, however, have any historical examples. So the solution, from an arms control standpoint, is control promoting policies. First, the sharing between the US and the Soviet Union of the Permissive Action Link technology, the PAL technology. This padlock guarded against the unauthorized use of nuclear weapons by requiring a code to activate the weapon. Now, it should be noted, the United States Navy refused PAL technology because they did not think unauthorized launch would be feasible from the sea. And it wasn't until the 1990s in the Clinton administration where the Navy was finally compelled to introduce that safeguard. Number two, the hotline agreement, which is basically a phone connection between the superpowers also helped to ensure that no loss of control led to escalation. Uh, three, the Convention on the Physical Protection of Nuclear Material in 1979 was an agreement between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, and then included other states, on standards for making sure weapons were stored correctly. This standard has since been extended to countries like Pakistan and India. Four, peacekeeping. Geographic buffer zones and pr procedures for encountering foreign ships and aircraft may also help reduce clashes. For example, after Eritrea and Ethiopia fought their war in the 1990s, there was a ceasefire buffer zone established, and the range of that zone was uh, just slightly longer than the range of the standard type D-30 Soviet artillery piece used both by the Ethiopians and the Eritreans. Although we've never had a purely accidental war caused by a loss of control, some states prepare to exploit wars that may occur accidentally. So you have a use it or lose it, use it, or lose it dilemma, or a use it or lose control of it, dilemma.
And this was the case in the Anglo-Dutch Wars. Ship commanders were sent to the other side of the ocean. They were months, if not a year, away from communications. And so they were given pre-delegated powers to engage in military action. The sixth link between weapons and war is instability. Wars can be caused by weapons whose performance characteristics make them war prone, either because they have a, a tremendous force multiplier when used in the attack, like for example, nuclear weapons or tanks, or B, they're very vulnerable in the defense, like exposed nuclear missiles or aircraft. So here we have the logic of preemption. Certain weapons are destabilizing because their operating preference for attack rather than defense can lead to preemption. If a state fears an attack, it will strike first. Knowing this, the other state will seek to do the same. So the Arab-Israeli War in 1967, we have the Israeli military emphasized that attacking first was better because they would shorten the war and save about 200 Israeli casualties a day. The Russo-German mobilization by train in the First World War led us to the hypothesis that railroads hastened the attack. But both countries didn't go to war because the railroads made it faster. They went to war to protect their allies. France went to mobilize to help Russia before Germany could defeat Russia. Russia mobilized before Austria-Hungary could destroy Serbia and Germany mobilized to stop France so they could destroy Russia so they could protect Austria-Hungary. Now for conventional weapons, alliances matter more than weapons technology in decisions for war because adding states to a war brings more power than bringing in more weapons. We saw this in the case of the 1967 Arab-Israeli War, the Isra Israeli cabinet waited until the U.S. permitted Israel to attack Egypt and reassured Israel that the U.S. would not compel Israel to abandon conquered territory like uh, the U.S. forced Israel in 1956. For nuclear weapons, however, power from the weapon matters more than the alliance. The U.S. and USSR possessed enormous numbers of nuclear weapons. These were very vulnerable forces with a huge offensive advantage. But both weapon systems were made secure against the first strike. They were made second strike capable by putting them underground in submarines and dispersing them in bombers. So that, those arsenals couldn't be destroyed. Now Dan Rater has called this the powder keg hypothesis, the idea that unstable weapons can lead to war. So he went and scanned the correlates of war, and he found almost no evidence that it was a cause of war. In the correlates of war, he found that of 67 wars, only three, 4.5%, involved wars that were preemptive. He argues that states rarely attack their neighbors in fear they will be attacked because of the fear that attacking first will alienate allies. Dan Rader argues that Israel attacked Egypt and, and Syria in 1967 only after Israel received indications from the U.S. that it would not intervene against Israel. Technology, therefore, mattered less than alliance politics. China's intervention in Korea was not a preemption of a U.S. feared attack on Beijing, which is what some observers argued, but an opportunity to inflict costs on the U.S. China relied on the deterrent effect of the Soviet atomic bomb to keep the Americans from conquering North Korea and then advancing across the Yalu River and advancing on Beijing. So the solution from an arms control standpoint is stability enhancing arms control policies. And these focus less on force totals between states than on how the comp composition of forces may create an incentive for striking first. So the idea is to ban weapons that are destabilizing. So, you know, you can ask the question, national missile defense, does it increase or decrease the likelihood of war? Here you can see a 1980s 
uh, airborne laser test platform. Well, the idea is you build a missile defense system, and then if the enemy fires nuclear weapons at you, you shoot many of them down and you save some of your cities. Of course, it's defensive, but it can increase the likelihood of war. How is that? Well, the enemy depends on their nuclear weapons for deterrence. In other words, they need to keep their weapons capable of destroying your cities in order to keep you from firing your missiles at them. If you build a missile defense system, it then allows you to do a first strike on the enemy. And you're not going to destroy all their missiles, but you're going to destroy enough of them that when they retaliate, the numbers of their missiles will be so few they can't get through your missile defense. So this means they have a dilemma, use it or lose it. So they're going to fire their nuclear weapons before your missile defense becomes operational. And you knowing this, you're going to fire your nuclear weapons at them before they fire theirs. So here's how a defensive system undermines second strike capability, undermines deterrence, leads to the reciprocal fear of surprise attack, and is thereby a cause of war. And it's one of the reasons why the ABM Treaty of 1973 basically tried to ban missile defense. So the influence of technology on policy. This is the core of the generative influence of weapons on war. If technology has an independent effect on policy, it must be more than a unit of power that can be used any way that the decision maker wants. We must think of technology as affecting policy and the way decision makers define goals because technology can make some goals easier than others. For example, we've put more humans on the surface of the moon than we have at the bottom of the Marianas Trench because the technology to go into space is easier than it is to go eight, nine kilometers into the bottom of the ocean. So we have offense defense theory. This is elaborated by Jack Levy in your reader. It argues that wars are caused according to the technical characteristics of weapons. If the weapon is offensive and suited to the geography of the conflict, their possession will increase the likelihood of war. You can think of tanks in the middle of a flat desert. Their cannon can fire very far. The tanks can cover great distances in very small amounts of times. If you didn't have a tank, it would be difficult to attack across the desert. It would be much slower. So the definition of an offensive advantage is that it's easier to destroy the opponent's army and take its territory than to defend one's own. Typically, mobility is taken as an indicator of an offensive advantage. So you have this tank. When the tank is in motion, it's pretty hard to hit. It's maneuvering to your rear to destroy your uh, vulnerable um, second echelon elements, like your logistics. So tanks are powerful. When they're not moving, you can walk up next to them with a sledgehammer, knock off the tread, and then it's not moving. So tanks are typically seen as offensive. They're much better in the attack than the defense. Doesn't mean they're bad in the defense. It's just that if you have one of these, it would be a waste of resources not to use it in the attack. The definition of a defense advantage is that it's harder to destroy the opponent's army and take its territory than to defend one's own. And this is captured by fortifications. It's very hard to use a fortification to attack an enemy. But the, the enemy is much more vulnerable to you if, if they attack you while you are inside the fortification. You can attack them from the walls. The offense-defense balance can be measured in two different ways. First, does the state have to spend more or less than one dollar on defensive forces for every dollar of offense that the enemy spends? So you think about a, a tank. The enemy spends about uh, two million dollars on a tank, but actually you could build an, an anti-tank missile for a much smaller cost. But if the tank is infantry, the infantry can suppress your anti-tank weapon so that you need infantry to suppress their infantry. And it gets a little bit complicated then to calculate it. You could think of a nuclear missile. Probably costs about two million dollars plus the cost of the warhead. Defending against a nuclear missile requires sensor technology and interceptors, then it's going to cost you a lot more than $2 million because you probably have to fire three or four interceptors. So tanks are perhaps cheap to stop in certain circumstances. Missiles are almost always very expensive to stop. So 
Here, we would choose to build a lot of anti-tank missiles and not build a defense against missile attacks. A second measure is, with a given inventory of forces, is it better to attack than defend? Now below, on the left, we have a Zulu warrior. Traditionally, the Zulu would fight in ritualized conflicts. You'd have a dispute between two villages. The elders would confer. The young men would show up. They would throw spears at each other. Two or three people would die. And then the, the elders would then come to a solution based on the relative strengths and performances of the young warriors. The Zulu chopped the spear in half, required men to walk up close and stab their enemy immediately. Now, the Zulu are not an actual ethnic group. They're a constructed identity made up of various refugee communities that were molded into a military society, almost an engineer type of society. The military force they created by shortening the spear uh, created an, an instrument of enormous uh, violence and power and offensive capability. And of course, the Zulus then swept all their opponents from the battlefield. On the right, you can see the chariot. This was initially seen as a very offensive weapon. It could travel great distances at enormous speeds. In battle, it allowed uh, charging of loosely defended and organized infantry, which caused the infantry to scatter and run away. But later, when it encountered disciplined infantry like the Romans, um, then it, the weapon was no longer effective and was much more useful as a defensive weapon because it could carry soldiers around the battlefield and deposit them where they could then fight. So here the chariot changed its status in response to sociological developments in military tactics. Now Van Evera made an attempt to characterize the different historical periods. So here you can see uh, the different periods. Uh, in the pre-Napoleonic era uh, up until the near present and looking at whether you have an offensive or defensive advantage. Uh, here the defensive advantage is defender and the aggressor is the offensive advantage. And you can see the dependent variable on the extreme right which shows the amount of warfare among the great powers as a consequence of these other variables including uh, diplomatic variables. So it's been hypothesized with very mixed evidence that the change in technology over the centuries has caused an oscillation between the frequency of peace and war. Well, you can think of the impact of gunpowder and its countermeasures in destroying castle walls at the end of the Middle Ages, which basically ended the Middle Ages. And the subsequent countermeasures by engineers like Vauban in France, who created low-level uh, very thick walled fortifications that were barely visible and were um, impervious to all but the largest cannon. So the historical timeline proposed by Levy is from 1200 to 1450 you have a defensive advantage, the art of defensive warfare, and the ability uh, enabled fortifications and cities to resist sieges. From 1450 to 1525 you had the offensive advantage. Artillery guns destroyed castle walls. From 1525 to 1650, it wasn't sure what the advantage was. On the one hand, you had very mobile armies because you had smaller cannon that could be moved around. On the other hand, you had these Vauban fortifications that were very low and flat and extremely thick walls. Here you can see in the top left the location of Vauban's fortifications that were built for Louis XIV. And you can see the trace of the fortification uh, at the bottom left showing how the walls had various triangles enabling soldiers at the different uh, embattlements uh, to protect each other. And you could also see the image on the right of the sappers or engineers and how they would impose a siege of a fortification. So from 1650 to 1740 there was a defensive advantage, clearly because of the fortifications of Vauban. From 1740 to 1789, we're not sure if it was an offensive or defensive advantage. On the one hand, we had Vauban fortifications. On the other hand, we had Frederick the, of, of Frederick the Great of Prussia's tactics, which are highly mobile and involved going around the enemy. You can see Napoleon at, in the uh, bottom left, and you can see Frederick the Great on the top right, and you can see Napoleon facing off against the Mamluks at the Battle of the Pyramids during his invasion of Egypt.
from 1815 to 1850? Again, we're not sure. There were not enough great power wars in that period. In fact, there were, there were no great power wars in that period. From 1850 to 1925, there was a defensive advantage. You had um, uh, fortifications protected by firepower, particularly artillery, but later including machine guns, and you had an increased dispersal of soldiers, which made the defense uh, very, very strong. The first indication of the strength of the defense was a battle at, at Plevna, in which the Russians attacked the Turks, and the Turks um, did very well from fortified positions. Uh, there were very few observers of this battle, but retrospectively it was the first event that indicated the um, uh, true effects and the later effects of the emerging technology. From 1930 to 1945, it was mostly offensive because of the internal combustion engine combined with the radio and armored uh, capability that led to tank forces. And then from 1945 to 2001, it's possible that we've returned to a defensive uh, advantage because of nuclear weapons. Now, the technology of the First World War was believed to favor the offense. And so the war opened with massive attacks by all the parties. In fact, defense was predominant, and thousands were killed until the soldiers themselves dug into the trenches. Now, the Ottawa Treaty banned anti-personnel landmines because it was argued that you know, they were disruptive to people's lives. You have these mines laid in uh, farm fields that then injure the farmers at the end of the war. But mines can also contribute to peace by strengthening um, a defense and therefore a deterrence. So it's, it's a complex debate as to whether it's worth having landmines or not. Nuclear weapons is the same problem. It's a big debate as to whether they're offensive or defensive, or in fact completely different, they're simply a deterrent. And then questions about whether or not they increase the likelihood of war or peace. We don't really have the data available to come to a micro-assessment of any of these. Now, we want to try to explain how weapons influence war. And it's all about policy formulation. Policy formulation is normally done as a balance between means and ends. Policy makers, or the politicians, the leaders, they determine what is desirable. Military experts are consulted to determine what is possible. Very often there's a balance between the two. In realism, we have the idea that power informs interest. So as countries get more power, they might actually change their interest. So politicians very often have to go to the military and say, what is possible? And if the military indicates they have more power, the civilians might change their goals. So we can conceive of a top-down type of relationship. If the state is powerful and wealthy, Policymakers don't need to ask the military for advice. In this instance, policy determines what instruments are needed and the industry simply builds them and equips the military with these assets. Now the problem is you know, one of statistical correlation. Most states buy weapons designed for particular goals. We rarely see a country seeking for a goal uh, without having some sort of preconceived established idea about what they want to do. Now you can also have the bottom-up process, where the military looks at weapons uh, and then provides advice to their leaders about what these weapons can be used for. Or civilians look at the weapons and wonder, well, what can we do with these now? Now the problem is, how and when does this happen? The first issue is that policymakers often don't listen to military advice. Uh, the US ultimately did not use nuclear weapons against the Soviet Union in 1948 and 1949 when uh, the U.S. had total advantage and the Soviet Union had not yet developed nuclear weapons. And frankly, it's very um, unclear often how to use technology. Most of the major powers didn't anticipate that World War I would turn into uh, a trenched warfare. They thought they would be maneuver with artillery. They didn't realize the firepower was so great that it made the soldiers so vulnerable that they had to dig in and disperse. Now, Stephen Biddle worked at the Institute of Defense Analysis, which is the uh, analytical branch of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff. So he made a 
analysis using computers of military technology. And he was particularly interested in characterizing specific branches of the military as either offensive or defensive. So in his computer model, he found that artillery, which is cannons, are generally offensive. Now, most artillery doesn't move. Some of it's self-propelled, or well, much of it is self-propelled today, but it's cumbersome to move it because they're heavy and slow. But they're offensive because you can concentrate their fires to create holes in the enemy's line, and then you can infiltrate through that hole. Now, aircraft are seen as defensive. That's strange. We think of airplanes as offensive because they fly very fast and very far and they can attack others. But aircraft are defensive because the weapons they deploy are best against moving targets. When aircraft try to drop a laser-guided bomb on a fixed target, like a tank not moving, very often it misses. But when an airplane drops little bomblets on a road that tanks are, tanks are driving down, it blows the treads off the tanks and brings them to a standstill. He also found that small numbers of tanks favor the defense, whereas large numbers of tanks favor the offense. Now this was a symmetrical model in which you had two even sides with even number of weapons. So he means you're more likely to get a defense if you have two sides with small numbers of tanks facing off. But if you have two sides with lots of tanks, there's more opportunity to try to envelop and surround each other. Number four, he found that infantry favor the defense because they are less mobile, but you still need them in the offense because combined arms operations means that you mix a tank with infantry and they work better because tanks can't see, infantry have no protection, so they each have a valuable characteristic. So infantry are a necessary ingredient, ingredient for the offense. Now I'm a professional army engineer. I think of a minefield as defensive. But we can also use minefields as offensive, because we can attack, and then we can protect our flanks using minefields. So getting into the nitty-gritty of how a specific weapon is going to affect an incentive to go to war is very difficult determination. And certainly, uh, if a war does break out, you want to be very clear about what effect the weapon is going to have. In World War I, um, the ultimate outcome of fighting in the trenches was not anticipated. And even World War II, although there were doctrines of tank warfare from Little, Hart, and Fuller, and uh, Heinz Guderian, who wrote a book about it, um, most leaders were not aware of the effect of maneuver warfare and combined arms operations, and, and what, uh, what an enormous offensive advantage would be conferred by the tank. Now, ultimately, this turns into complex combinations. At the operational level, which is when we're looking at thousands of soldiers maneuvering on the battlefields, you combine weapons, tanks, artillery, aircraft, infantry. So there's a lot more variation on how weapons should be used because of the different types of terrain. You can't use a tank in a river. Well, some Soviet tanks had snorkels uh, that allowed them to drive under the river, like on the riverbed to the other bank. On top, you can see a picture of General Moltke, the German uh, general. He had the idea of an offensive defense. You invade another country, but then you capture a hill and you get the enemy to attack you. And this was frequently used as a tactic operationally by the Germans in the Franco-Prussian War of 1870. Doctrinal studies have generally found that geopolitical situation matters more than technology. The British built tanks for World War II to operate in the desert and operate quickly and to exploit like cavalry. The French built tanks to support their infantry because they were outnumbered by Germany and were going to fire defensively. Germany built offensive tanks because it didn't want to fight a two-front war against France and Russia. So the geography and the geopolitics defined the technology. For doctrinal scholars, technology does not appear have to have any automatic bias for attacking and starting a war or being used defensively and essentially being for peace. Now there is evidence that weapons characteristics have operational and deployment impacts. Now these are not detectable because they're not normally supervised by political leaders. They are put into effect by military leaders who understand the technology. Given the speed and engagement time, it is simply not possible to politically control this military asset. The military technology has its own preferred operating characteristics, and this is incorporated into the military cost and military practice. But it's not clear, however, that this necessarily leads to war.
Israel. We can see here in the Israeli attack in 1967 that the Israeli Air Force had a very strong predisposition for attacking. Because if they didn't attack first, then they could be the target of attack and they would lose some of their airplanes and the war would last longer and be more costly and the Israelis would lose more lives. Now we know from the case studies that ultimately the technological imperative of the Israeli Air Force was not critical in leading Israel to attack its neighbors. Ultimately, that was a political choice made possible by Israel's tacit support by the United States. Here we can see the location of the islands of Abu Musa and the Greater and Lesser Tombs that were seized in an amphibious invasion by the Iranians in 1971. And this occurred after the Shah had purchased a large navy and hovercraft amphibious force to land marines. What's notable is that in the lead up to this, there was no indication that the Shah had made any claim to those islands. So this could not be characterized as a dormant dispute. It wasn't a dispute where Iran, Iran claimed the islands and then was waiting to get the technological capability to, to satisfy the conquest. There was simply no claim. The Iranians have made claims to control the islands going back thousands of years, but those are more for sort of a part of philological studies than they were foreign policy. Now, weapons make some policy options easier than others. At this level, technology is already integrated with other ingredients to generate a list of options. You have the uh, diplomatic input, the cost input, the domestic political input, and finally the technological input. And all of that affects the goals and the costs of making a decision to go to war. So the technology is rarely super important. So I did field research uh, over a number of years uh, in Pakistan and uh, when I was uh, in Pakistan I was there for several months at a time so I have a great deal of familiarity with the different groups in Pakistan that are involved in the government's decision-making process. Most of my interviews were with former military generals and uh, former highly placed diplomats or members of the cabinet in Pakistan's government. So my goal was to find out whether the U.S. sale of the M48 patent tank caused the 1965 war. So there's a basic timeline, 1947-1948, uh, you have the first Kashmir War between India and Pakistan. Uh, it ends up in a stalemate. Uh, India does not want to ally with the U.S., where Pakistan needs an ally because it needs to arm itself uh, to deal with India. So in 1954, the U.S. provided Pakistan about 400 M48 patent tanks. The 1950s was generally a peaceful period between Pakistan and India. They're both focused on economic development and Pakistan was focused on assimilating its military equipment. In 1958, there was a military coup in Pakistan and the M48 tank was integrated into the doctrine. Now, initially, Pakistan's plan was simply to absorb an Indian attack. But after the military coup, people with military experience rose higher and higher in the policymaking process in uh, Islamabad, and they brought with them their experience of this amazing tank. And so this tank had an impact on foreign policy. And initially, led to a plan of counterattack. If India attacks Pakistan, Pakistan will counterattack into India with the tank. And then later, the military tried to create an offensive preemption plan. If India is about to attack Pakistan, Pakistan would attack first. But that plan was never implemented. But you had this weapon system that influenced the military and the military personnel in the government to seek an offensive option. Now, in October, November 1962, China defeated India. India began a, began a large military buildup. Pakistan became insecure because they couldn't build up as quickly as India. So they had a closing window of India's vulnerability, a time within which Pakistan could attack India and after which Pakistan would have no strength to be able to redress issues. Now, unable to buy new weapons, Pakistan went back to take a look at its military inventory to determine what means it had at its disposal. And so the military here advertised this M48 tank as an instrument to deter India by threatening to attack deep. Now, ultimately, uh, there was a dispute. That was over Kashmir. And in 1965, there was a decision made in Pakistan to unfreeze the Kashmir issue 
by sending infiltrators in to escalate a conflict and then to force the international community to notice the problem and then to pressure India to allow self-determination for the Kashmiris. Now, the arrows indicate the different plans for the M48 tank. The very long arrow is the journalistic interpretation, which was Pakistan would drive their tanks to New Delhi and force India to surrender. This was never a plan of the military. But irresponsible members of the government would boast this to the journalists, and so this became the conception of how the tanks would be used uh, among a large segment of the civilian population. Now, in 1965, when Pakistan started their conflict in Kashmir, India counterattacked. And so Pakistan, uh, to counterattack, used armored vehicles, but not patent tanks, but older Shermans. And you can see in the arrow labeled one, Pakistan drove towards Jammu in what an area is called the Kamb. Now, India then counterattacked with the red arrow by driving its military force, particularly its armored force, from Ludhiana to Jalundur up to Amritsar, and then it drove across the border towards Lahore. And then Pakistan then deployed its armored forces at number two in the upturning blue arrow to try to get around Amritsar and isolate the Indian army. There it failed. It failed because the M48 tank got stuck in seasonal marshes uh, that were produced by the Punjab, the region of the five rivers. And ultimately the war ended when both India and Pakistan effectively ran out of resources, specifically ammunition, uh, to continue the conflict. Now the M48 was a key factor in leading to the war with India in 1965. First, it led the Pakistani civilian and military leaders to believe that they had a powerful offensive weapon that would deter Indian attack, so that Pakistan had freedom of action. And number two, counterfactually, if there had not been an M48 tank in Pakistan, and instead there had been more defensive weapon systems like artillery, Pakistan would not have become overconfident and would not have escalated the dispute over Kashmir into an attack into India. So where does this leave us in the link between weapons and war? Well, there are some tentative conclusions. One, there is a relationship, but it can be at best a cause of war, but not the cause of the underlying tension. And two, the relationship is complex and indirect with many alternative explanations. 